You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. Only one thing in life is certain. We are all going to die. At the age of just 65, Michael Greger's grandmother was on her deathbed. End-stage heart disease had crippled her body beyond even the reach of modern medicine, and she had been sent home to die. Clinging to any last opportunity to save her life, Gregor sent her to a health center developed by Nathan Pritikin. There, she spent her final days subsisting on an exclusively whole food, plant-based diet. Three weeks later, she was gone. Gone, meaning you'd be hard-pressed to find her. She not only left her wheelchair, but began walking up to 10 miles a day. In the end, she lived to be 96. This apparent miracle pulled Gregor under the spell of nutrition's incredible power. But what is a whole food, plant-based diet anyway? Put simply, the term whole food refers to anything which is natural, unprocessed, and closely resembles the way it grew in the ground. Plant-based refers to, well, plants. In other words, eat grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, fruits, and vegetables, and avoid processed and animal-derived products, including meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. Sound extreme? Hold that thought, because you might just be about to change your mind. The book is split into two parts. The first involves 15 chapters, each one on how not to die from a certain disease. For example, how not to die from heart disease, how not to die from diabetes, how not to die from liver diseases, and so on. The second part details what you should eat to stay healthy, with Gregor providing detailed information on the qualities and benefits of various plant foods. You will need to read the book to get all this detail, but this book insight will walk you through three key themes. One, how plant foods are able to treat and reverse disease. Two, why isn't this common knowledge? The dark motivations of the food industry. Three, how not to die early. So let's begin. Here's Gregor speaking on talks at Google. What's the best way to prevent death. Every year the CDC compiles the top 15 causes of death. I said, well, let's just go through the list. Killer number one is heart disease. Cancer is a word loaded with fear, uncertainty, and connotations of probable death. Fortunately, scientists may have finally found the answer. It turns out that a powerful drug known as Ilicor B may be a key predictor of mortality, able to prevent DNA damage, halt cancer spread, prevent blood cancers, rev up liver function, and lower the risk of progression of prostate cancer. Actually, it seems Gregor has made a typo. He accidentally spelled the name of the drug backwards. It's not Iller Corby, but goes by the name of broccoli. For any anti-cancer compound to earn its seat in the Hall of Fame, it needs to know how to kill malicious cancer cells while giving the healthy ones a wide berth. In cruciferous vegetables, the family to which broccoli belongs, that magic ingredient may be sulforaphane. Tested in a petri dish, sulforaphane was able to attack leukemia cells while stepping aside all healthy ones. When it went on to be tested in living subjects, it managed to boost the survival rate of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma sufferers by 42%. This is not some fancy drug with a list of side effects as long as its name. This is a humble helping of plain old broccoli. Another readily available cancer-fighting compound is an exotic spice, turmeric. Cancer can be thought of as a guest that overstays its welcome. To allow fresh ones to grow, cells have an inbuilt self-destruction mechanism. Cancer cells, however, manage to deactivate their own suicide trigger and continue to divide. Curcumin, the active element in turmeric, appears to turn this cue back on, hampering the progression of breast, brain, blood, colon, kidney, liver, lung, 
and skin cancer. Though they have not yet been tested against cancer in clinical trials, herbs and spices are some of the most antioxidant-rich compounds on the planet. A sprinkle of turmeric in your curry or other things you cook is really worth it for the possible protection against our major killers. As we've seen, heart disease is the result of an artery-clogging diet made up of cholesterol, saturated fat, and trans fat, elements found in processed foods, and naturally in animal-based foods. When we remove such items from a patient's diet, not only does progression of the disease stop in its tracks, the body can actually begin to dissolve some of this plaque. In other words, sufferers can turn back the time and get better, just like Gregor's grandmother did. This may work for the nation's leading killer, but how will it fare for other life-threatening diseases, say type 2 diabetes? Thirteen diabetics became the consenting guinea pigs to test just that. As Dr. Greger describes, they were told to eat one big salad every day, as well as veggie bean soup, a handful of nuts and seeds, fruit at every meal, a pound of cooked greens, and some whole grains, to restrict their animal product consumption and to eliminate refined grains, junk food, and oil. The result? After just seven months, the subject's A1C levels, a measure of diabetes, dropped so low they were no longer considered diabetic, even after stopping most of their medication. Not only did the 13 improve their health with a whole-food, plant-based diet, they actually reversed their diabetes. It's hardly surprising that the healthiest populations are those for whom this diet is the default diet. For instance, in large parts of Africa and Asia, heart disease was a rare condition, like one person in a thousand. But in places where a Western diet is made inroads, it's become much more prevalent. So your risk of disease can be predicted based on where you live. The same may be true for your risk of asthma. The results of the International Study of Asthma and Allergies in Childhood, which looked at one million children across a hundred different countries, showed that asthma, allergy, and eczema rates varied from 20 to 60-fold across the globe. The lowest rates of such diseases were found in populations eating mostly starch-based meals. Additionally, children eating two or more portions of fruit and vegetables a day were found to have half the chances of contracting asthma. As well as the addition of healthy components, the subtraction of triggering foods can also have a profound impact. For instance, eliminating dairy and eggs from a child's diet, Gregor says, may improve lung function in as little as eight weeks. Yet if plant foods are really so miraculous and animal foods so dangerous, wouldn't we already know all of this? Sadly, it seems various parties will do anything to keep us in the dark. Let's wrap up for now, but let's recap what we've learned from How Not to Die. We've learned how plant-based foods can help reverse the effects of the world's top killers. Everything from cancer to asthma can be affected by eating your veggies. Next time, we'll acknowledge the elephant in the room. Why don't we know this already? Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're continuing our major exploration into how to beat back all the major diseases in the world. We're looking to beat death. Dr. Michael Greger wrote a book called How Not to Die, Discover the Foods Scientifically Proven to Prevent and Reverse Disease. Last time, we went over how plant-based foods can be used to prevent, treat, and reverse the top diseases of global death. We're going to continue this train of thought and ask a very troubling question. Why don't we know this stuff already? Here's Dr. Greger again on Talks at Google. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is given the right conditions, the body can heal itself. In 1977, the dietary goals for the United States were published with one very clear message. Cut down on animal-based products. Unsurprisingly, not everyone was happy with this new guideline. 
In fact, the meat, milk, and egg industries kicked up such a fuss that the advice wasn't just withdrawn. The entire body responsible for the report, the so-called McGovern Committee, was dissolved. Sadly, we may be unlikely to hear the message in future guidelines, given that members of today's U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committee have no qualms about taking cash incentives from chocolate bar companies, McDonald's, and Coca-Cola. Almost 20 years after that first report, beef producers once again felt they were being picked on. It was in 1996 when television legend Oprah Winfrey, in a revealing interview about mad cow disease with a former cattle rancher, claimed, it has just stopped me cold from eating another burger. Within days, beef prices slumped, as did the shoulders of cattle ranchers across Texas. They ended up entangling Oprah in a long and expensive lawsuit. With the help of Dr. Greger, who was called in to prove the interview was based on reasonable and reliable scientific inquiry, facts, or data, Oprah eventually won. Nevertheless, this stands to show the frightening amount of power the industry wields. Just behind the meat industry looms another interested party, one which quietly waits for you to get sick and swoops in to offer you an expensive solution. This is, of course, the pharmaceutical industry. There's a reason American physicians are more likely to prescribe invasive and possibly painful procedures over an extra helping of broccoli or cauliflower at dinner time. The money to be made in interventional medicine is vast. As Gregor remarks, Global spending on prescription drugs has now reached half a trillion dollars a year. This is at the same time that there seems to be no cash for promoting a healthy diet. Sadly, modern medicine does not patch us up half as well as we think. The most commonly prescribed drugs are those designed to force down cholesterol and blood pressure levels, and yet they are barely effective. One study found them to offer patients less than 5% benefit over five years, a whole food, plant-based diet, on the other hand, may be 20 times more powerful than statins. This is not prescribed, of course, because how do you patent dark, leafy green vegetables? Our reliance on medicine to pull us through is short-sighted at best. With antibiotics regularly pumped into the billions of animals we consume each year, we may be nearing a post-antibiotic era, one which Dr. Margaret Chan anticipates to be the end of modern medicine as we know it. In terms of nutrition, though, many doctors may be just as clueless as we are. How we fuel our body has a profound effect on our overall health, and yet only a quarter of U.S. medical schools were found to provide teaching on nutrition. Given the closeness of the pharmaceutical, medical, and food industries, this is hardly surprising. We know that a single meat-based dish can raise blood pressure within days, that one fast food dinner can inflame the arteries, and that trans fat in any amount is unsafe. Such facts, Gregor argues, should naturally rule out all meat and dairy as safe for human consumption. And yet a doctor is still more likely to promote a low meat diet rather than a no meat one. The reason? They don't think patients will commit. Unfortunately, condescension in the physician's office may equate to the needless loss of life. Let's break for now, but we'll wrap up what How Not to Die has taught us so far. This time, we've gone over how powerful the food industry can be. It's a simple truth that meat and dairy causes incredible damage to the human body, but there's too much money to be made stuffing us full of cow patties and performing major surgeries. Nobody makes any money if we're eating healthy. Next up, we'll conclude with Dr. Greger's message and figure out how to prevent an early demise. Then we'll reflect on the book's impact. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Here are the 15 leading um, uh, reasons Americans die, and a plant-based diet can help prevent, nearly all of them can help treat more than a half of them, in some cases even reverse the progression of disease in some cases, including sometimes our top three killers. That's Dr. Greger in a Talks at Google. 
We're concluding our look into Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die, Discover the Foods Scientifically Proven to Prevent and Reverse Disease. In that clip, he's referring to something we all know, that eating plants can help you keep from dying. Last time we went over how the food and medicine industries don't want you to know that. There's too much money in killing you early. Now we'll get into the cherry-topped cheesecake of Gregor's message. We'll get into actual ways you can prevent death, or at least an early death. Then we'll review the impact the book has had. Now that you've been showered with evidence pertaining to the power of a plant-based diet, you may be wondering what to do with it. After all, you don't eat evidence, you eat food. For this reason, Gregor has a number of tips that will painlessly launch you into the healthiest diet on Earth. First of all, don't let yourself be intimidated by all-or-nothing thinking. Gregor only asks that you try a plant-based diet for three weeks. View it as an experiment. If, after three weeks, you're entirely unconvinced, then nothing is lost. However, he notes that most people feel so much better after this short period of time that they naturally want to continue. To get you started, Gregor recommends exploring recipes from ForksOverKnives.com and StraightUpFood.com, with additional support from a site called 21DayKickstart.org. To help you keep track of your progress, Dr. Gregor has his very own app called The Daily Dozen. This nifty app lays out the fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts you should be eating every day, all packed into a handy list you can check off as you go along. For example, aim to eat three servings of whole grains each day. That sounds like a lot, but it can include porridge, whole grain pasta, or popcorn. Your goal is to check off as many of the 12 elements as possible, though don't worry if you don't score 100%. Even 60% is better than nothing. Be extra vigilant for decision fatigue. Each day, we're gifted the ability to make a certain number of decisions. Once the quota is depleted, however, we rapidly lose control. Why else would fruit be placed at the front of the supermarket while sweets and chocolate lurk at the checkouts? Your exhausted end-of-day brain isn't the least bit concerned about a fatty streak that may kill you dead in 10 years' time. And to avoid falling into the junk food trap late at night, the easiest fix is to keep all of it out of the house. If you were to focus on consuming any foods in particular, opt for beans, berries, and leafy vegetables. We've already learned about the power of sulforaphane, the compound built into cruciferous vegetables. Beans, meanwhile, have been touted as the most important predictor of survival in older people. One possible reason is fiber, an element 97% of Americans are deficient in. One study indicated that if the world ate more fruit, 4.9 million lives could be saved every single year. If you had to pick one family of fruit to focus on, you might want to make it berries, especially if your aim is youthfulness. Antioxidants have been shown to prevent aging by neutralizing free radicals. These are tiny charged particles that are thought to cause wrinkles, damage your DNA, and ultimately break down our bodies from the inside. Fresh salmon contains around three units of this antioxidant power. Blackberries, on the other hand, contain upward of 650. You may be thinking, what about all the sugar in fruits? Isn't that bad for us? This worry has turned out to be unwarranted. In a month-long study, 17 people were told to eat 20 servings of fruit every single day, adding up to a huge amount of fructose intake. Yet after the experiment was over, the participants failed to gain any weight at all. If anything, they experienced several healthy side effects. People have similar fears about nuts. Due to their high fat content, you would expect a diet dense in nuts to spell extra weight gain for anyone with a regular intake. And yet, 20 clinical trials failed to associate any significant level of weight gain with their consumption, even in those eating 120 pistachios a day. If this doesn't encourage you to load up on these tasty treats, it's been found that eating few nuts and seeds is predicted to kill more people worldwide than all illicit drugs combined. For example, even a small number per week can prolong a woman's life by the equivalent of jogging four hours a week. One study found that eating just a handful of Brazil nuts a week can lower your cholesterol by 20%. Unfortunately, that doesn't get you off the hook for all forms of exercise. 
Though food industries enjoy overstating the role of inactivity in our obesity crisis, when actually we are more active than before, exercise may be a major factor in determining the age at which you die. The right amount of movement can defend against cognitive decline, high blood pressure, and insomnia while improving the immune system and mood. A simple solution could be, bear with me, a standing desk. You may feel silly, especially if you're the only one towering above your colleagues, but standing may burn as much as extra 50 calories an hour. But standing may burn as much as an extra 50 calories an hour. That's the equivalent of running 10 marathons a year. If you're more about the movement, convince your workmates to join you for a walking meeting. Research has shown that 40 minutes walking each day can account for a 24% drop in mortality. When discussing a diet that omits meat and animal products, the subject of nutritional deficiencies is bound to come up. If planned correctly, you have no cause for concern. If anything, you are likely to start getting more of the nutrients you need to function optimally. When studied, one group of vegetarians was found to be achieving higher levels of almost every nutrient, including calcium, iron, and various vitamins. The only exception is vitamin B12, which is absolutely crucial if embarking on a plant-based diet. Once acquired from uncleaned vegetables, we no longer have access to a natural source of B12. Fortunately, it only takes a sprinkle of nutritional yeast or a daily or weekly supplement to meet your requirements. While the intended effect of this book is good health, it's imperative to highlight other beneficial outcomes of leading a plant-based diet. We find ourselves avidly recycling, taking the bus, and switching off lights in order to do our bit for the environment. But the biggest contribution may be stop eating meat. Animal agriculture accounts for 9% of global carbon dioxide emissions, and livestock account for 37% of human-caused methane emissions. Methane is 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse emission, and the biggest culprit is cattle. If you can't give up other kinds of meat, at least work on eliminating beef from your diet. It won't come as any surprise that Gregor is a vegan, and as you read How Not to Die, it starts to read suspiciously like propaganda, presenting only evidence that fit the author's only plants are good, all animal products are bad point of view. Critics pointed out that the way Gregor has misrepresented the results of studies or cherry-picked evidence. There's also the fact that we're all genetically different and so require different diets for optimum health. Some people, such as his grandmother, may benefit more than others by going vegan. To be fair, Gregor doesn't actually push for a vegetarian or vegan diet, only for one that has been proven to reverse heart disease and other diseases. In his mind, this happens to be a whole food, plant-based one. Part of his mission is to educate the public beyond what he considers the hidden agenda of government, big agriculture, and big pharma, and he does this through his nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Even if you don't fully agree with him, the site has a wealth of great information that may prolong your life or prevent disease. We're wrapping up our discussion on how not to die. In this last lesson, we've learned that we aren't done with eating healthy just by knowing better. Gregor offers resources and practices to actually improve your health. You can literally start this right now and set a plan for yourself. We're told that we are born into ill health, that disease is a side effect of simply being alive. But after reading How Not to Die, you realize there is a choice. Do you want blood that stifles cancer growth or promotes it? Food that stiffens your arteries or relaxes them? A life filled with energy and contentment or pills and hospitals? And the best part is it's so easy. Here he is again on Toxic Google. And, and I mean, spoiler alert, it's the same healthy diet that does. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Healthful eating is like paying into a pension pot. You're acting now to defend against the future. The question is, what kind of future do you want that to be?
Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.